I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us recite the Venite together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. 
He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let us bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the, into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The other day, Cheryl and I were enjoying a pleasant afternoon on our deck that faces our backyard. Immediately beside the deck is a small patio area with stone pavers. Cheryl was noticing that once again, there were weeds beginning to find their way up through the gaps. She commented about them never giving up as she was. That got me thinking. We have developed a concept of what a backyard should be and what it should look like. We attempt to create and maintain a landscape paradise. But nature, being what it is, keeps coming back at us, and our private little world requires constant attention and maintenance. Grass needs to be cut, weeds pulled, varmints eliminated. Then I got thinking that this is how racism and white supremacy work. We as a culture have developed a vision, if you will, as to what our society is to be. We pass laws, we institute policy, we structure our culture in such a way that it fits our image, and then we do what it takes to maintain it, to pull the invading weeds, to keep varmints away as, so as not to spoil our home. We hire armed enforcers, the police, to do the work of weeding and rid us of the varmints. But today, we're beginning to wonder what has gone wrong. What has happened to the police? Do they really reflect society? Then I realize that the system is not broken. The system is performing as it was created to do. The problem is not the police. I have no doubt that most police officers are caring and good men and women placed in difficult situations. So let's not confuse this with do we or do we not support police? But no, the problem is not the police, but what our society has asked of the police and has empowered them to be. The police are doing what our society, as dominated by white America, has formulated them to do. The laws we have created, the rulings of our judicial system, the establishment and structure of our police departments are designed primarily not to protect and assist all of us, but to protect America from men of color, primarily African-American men. Does this sound extreme, an exaggeration? I recommend a book titled Chokehold, Policing Black Men by Paul Butler. Butler is a former pro federal prosecutor graduate of Harvard Law School and currently a law professor at Georgetown University Law Center. His book leaves very little doubt that, particularly in the cities, the police target and harass black men between the ages of 15 and 35. They do this in order to build up a rap sheet on all that they can and to intimidate them into being, in, in, into being controlled. The police will arrest these men of color for any violation they witness, particular misdemeanors such as jaywalking, spitting, turning without signaling, and so on. Then, if the individual is arrested for a felony at some date, there already exists a record, and it makes it easier to prosecute. In particular, stop and frisk has become a major tool of the police toolbox. This practice developed from a 1968 Supreme Court case called Terry versus Ohio. Without getting into the details of the case, the court ruled that it was constitutional for the police to briefly detain someone when they had reasonable suspicion that a crime may be occurring or that it was about to occur. Additionally, cops can pat down the person whom they have stopped if they have reasonable suspicion that the suspect is armed. Thus, stop and frisk. 
The fact that this was so vague and leaves it up to the police determination has made it virtually impossible to set parameters. It resulted in a green light for police to stop and frisk anyone at any time. Now, Paul Butler states that this proactive policing technique has two purposes. First, to provide a means to search people who the police have no cause to arrest. And second, to deter people from carrying contraband, guns, drugs. Butler states that this view that it deters carrying contraband is widely held, but has never been proven. But it does help the police to establish their authority and, as they believe, to maintain control. You may recall that George Floyd was stopped and detained by Minneapolis police because he fit the description of someone thought to have attempted to pass counterfeit money. This discussion is just touching the tip of the iceberg, and I encourage you to read Paul Butler's book or find other studies. The point of this is that our society has created a problem that arose out of racism and remains because of systemic racism. And we, if we are to be Christian, are called to actively participate in changing the views of society and the systems that perpetuate racism. Now, why do I say we are called? Well, look at today's gospel lesson for a moment. Last week, if you recall, we read from Matthew what is generally referred to as the Great Commission. Jesus charging his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded them. Today's lesson comes earlier in Matthew and describes the sending of the twelve to the lost sheep of the house of Israel not to all the nations, but keeping it in-house, so to speak. Specifically, they are charged with proclaiming the good news, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. In other words, they are being sent to minister to those who are lost, to those who are forgotten, to those who are dispossessed, abused, and exploited. Jesus' ministry was directed to those such as these, not to the rich, the established, the ones in power and control, but to those exploited and living on the margins. If we are to carry on the teachings and work of Jesus, we too are called to direct our efforts towards those who are oppressed, forgotten, marginalized. And we can do that in part by helping create a society that does not systematically punish people because of their race or other factors such as nationality, gender, or religion. I recommend another writer, this one a noted American theologian, James H. Cohn. He died just a few years ago, but he had a major impact on theology in America over the past 50 years. He was professor of syst systemic, uh, systematic theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York City until his death. And he is instrumental in the establishing of black liberation theology. His first book, Black Theology and Black Power, is a good starting point for all of us. Cohn wrote, it in, it wrote the book in 1969, shortly after the riots resulted from the murder of Martin Luther King and the establishment of the Black Power Movement of the 1960s. Cohn maintained that liberation is the heart of the Christian gospel, and that blackness is the primary mode of God's presence. Now he wrote, and I quote, being black in America has very little to do with skin color. To be black means that your heart, your soul, and your body are where the dispossessed are, end quote. The dispossessed would apply to all in our society who are marginalized. And we all must so identify if we are to be Christians. Silence gives support to the powers that be, Cohn wrote. That sounds a lot like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, doesn't it? Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Cohn maintained that racism is possible because whites 
are indifferent to suffering and patient with cruelty. Jesus, however, was not. Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of Satan, and his life was a deliberate offensive against those powers that held man captive. If we are to follow Jesus and demand justice, we must first demand freedom for all who have been held back and controlled by our society. Black, brown, LGBTQ, women, Muslims. If we are to be made righteous through Christ, then we too must be for the poor, for God, and against this world that mankind has created. We here at St. Thomas of Becket may not be able to fix all things and eliminate racism in America, but we can influence things here in our community, in Morgantown, and even in West Virginia. We can do this by supporting legislative reforms that will require all to have available the same resources and educational opportunities, to establish policing procedures and training that result in our police spending their time helping and not harassing and controlling, to truly protect and serve, and to view all governmental and community initiatives in light of their impact on the poor, the dispossessed, the marginalized, the powerless, and not simply by what we ourselves will get out of it. If it helps the dispossessed, it will help us as well, because it will help society. We will all be better for it. Jesus calls us to reach out to the dispossessed, to adopt and implement a liberation gospel that will address the injustice of the world and help bring about the kingdom of heaven. I end with the prayer that I frequently use because it says so much in such few words. O oh God, lift us up out of ourselves into thy being, that seeing thee we may strike the quick nerve of our inner lives, and so find out what manner of men and women we were meant to be and what manner of world we were meant to build. Amen. Let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. 
Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, and your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, give us boldness, justice, and compassion as we offer our prayers, responding, Kyrie eleison. Open our eyes to see the stranger in our midst, offering hospitality and companionship, believing that the Holy Spirit visits us through those we do not know. Let us pray. Reveal the fruits of suffering to all who are heavy laden with despair, that they may receive your endurance, grow in character, and live in hope. Let us pray. Strengthen our hands and voices to proclaim the good news of Christ through the daily events of our lives. And to those we encounter in the course of the day, let us pray. Increase vocations to the various ministries of our church, especially our religious communities, whose members hold the church, her mission and peoples, in prayer, and who work for the joy of the gospel. Let us pray. Bless our nation, our president and members of Congress. Give them wisdom in their deliberations, that legislation and programs may serve the best interests of the common good and the needs of the global community. Let us pray. Hold in your arms of mercy those who are ill, and grant to those who have died a room prepared by your own hands. Let us pray. Let us endure faithfully in the practice of intercession as we continue our petitions. We pray for Kathleen, Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Irene, Kevin, Raylan, Shayla, Mike, Alicia, Lee, Greg, Fred, Guy, Wendy, Donna, and Michael. For all who have died in the communion of your church, especially Mary Wyatt and Patricia, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Let us pray. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Thomas, White Sulphur Springs, and in our companion diocese in Colombia, we pray for the Reverend David Hincapi, Mission Santo Domeus. At this time, I invite you to offer your own prayers of intercession. Lord, we pray for all in this parish and in this community. We pray for protection in this time of disease, but we also pray for boldness in this time of facing that long disease that we have in this country of racism. We pray that you, we will be your voices in the world, but more than that, we pray that we will be your ears to listen for those of us who are white in this congregation, that we will listen to those 
who are not white, who have a different story to tell about who we are and a new vision to show us for who we might become. Lord, give us ears, give us voices, and also hands to help. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
let us join together in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, our unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we will celebrate our birthdays and anniversaries upcoming this week in the parish. For birthdays, we have two, Dick and Tobias. Let us say the birthday prayer together. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthday of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We also recognize two anniversaries, the anniversaries of David and Gloria and Jeff and Beth. Let us pray the anniversary prayer together. Loving God, you have blessed these couples with the gift of marriage. We pray that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other, and that they will find in each other the reflection of your abiding and sustaining grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now for a few announcements. Our schedule will continue as is for now. Uh, the next few weeks we will be having our coffee hour um, following the service as usual, and we will also be having our book discussion at 9 and this morning prayer service at 10. The evening prayers Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 will continue during the week. On the 25th, we will have our next youth group event, and then on June 22nd through July 5th, I will be taking some time off, and we will be encouraging our parish to take part in the diocesan uh, Sunday service or, and or the National Cathedral Sunday service. And then we will return to this, uh, this celebration. As always, we will continue to update you as plans progress for regathering, and we welcome your input into those plans. And now, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen.